All right. Uh, welcome back, astronomy. Uh, today I'm going to cover chapter 12, part one, um, asteroids and meteorites, as well as comets. And then tomorrow we'll cover Pluto and cosmic collision, small bodies of planets. <clears throat> so asteroids and meteorites, what are asteroids like? So asteroids are rocky. They're usually leftovers of a planet formation, hence the reason why a lot of them are cratered and they're not perfectly round. Um, the largest asteroid is Ceres, 1,000 kilometers in diameter. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands in catalogs, um, probably over a million with a diameter less than a kilometer, but you know we do catalog asteroids. Small asteroids are a little bit more common than large asteroids, probably due to the collision and all that. Um, but all the asteroids in the solar system wouldn't even add up to be a small terrestrial planet. So, yes, they are numerous, but um, they're small. So some pictures of some asteroids that have been named and cataloged. Some asteroids um, actually have moons. So because they're large enough, they have their own gravitational pull. So the asteroid Ida has a small moon named Dactyle over here. Now, figuring out the mass and density of asteroids is you know, kind of difficult because we have to figure out the gravitational pull or effect it has on other objects. Um, but if we can measure the orbit of its moon, it might tell us its you know, the mass of that asteroid. And then from there, we can figure out density. Some are just solid rock, and some are just basically piles of rubble put together. Now, the orbits of asteroids, we have, I, I kind of want to talk about two here. So we have our main asteroid belt that's in between Mars and Jupiter. But then there's actually kind of a secondary belt out here called the Trojan Asteroids. And there's two groupings. There's a group here, and there's a group over here, and I know it's really, really faint in your picture. They are called Trojan Asteroids, and they're always 60 degrees in front of Jupiter and 60 degrees behind Jupiter. Um, so even Jupiter has a gravitational effect on these asteroids and pulls them out a little bit. Um, so there's always a group of Trojan asteroids in front of Jupiter and behind. So why are there very few asteroids beyond Jupiter's orbit? The correct answer is C, and I know I didn't really talk about it. Um, the reason why it's C is remember the frost line. The frost line is in between Mars and Jupiter. Everything inside of Mars tends to be terrestrial, and everything um, you know, beyond that can be gas. Um, and so few asteroids beyond Jupiter's orbit, well, it's because ice could form in the outer solar system, and they would not be classified as asteroids. Which explanation for the belt seems the most plausible? All right, the correct answer is actually C as well. Um, it's just kind of this mid-distance point where all the asteroids from our solar system formation, you know, seems to have survived. Okay, moving on to orbital res resonances. So asteroids in orbital resonance with Jupiter do experience periodic nudges, hence the Trojan asteroids here and the Trojan asteroids that <clears throat> follow Jupiter. But eventually those nudges move the asteroids out of their resonant orbits and it kind of can leave gaps in the asteroid belt. The origin of our asteroid belt, rocky plat planetismals between Mars and Jupiter did not accrete into a planet. And it's just, the, maybe I should have moved my quiz question after this slide, sorry about that. Jupiter's gravity through influence of orbital residence stirred up asteroid orbits and prevented their accretion into a planet. So Jupiter, Jupiter probably prevented uh, the accretion or the collision of all these asteroids to form, possibly a, a fifth terrestrial planet. Okay, moving on to meteor and meteorites. So there is a difference. Meteorite is something that falls through Earth's atmosphere and does reach the surface. And a meteor is the bright tail, a shooting star that you see in the sky. It's left by a meteorite. And so here's a picture of an actual meteorite that struck a house or an apartment, went through the roof, and um, landed. And you can kind of see right there, there's the meteorite. So there are two types of meteorite types, primitive and process. Primitive means that the composition hasn't changed. And we can learn a lot about the history of our solar system by examining prim primitive meteorites, um, because they formed at the same time our solar system formed. Processed ones, there's not a lot of them. I mean, at most, meteorites are primitive, but there are a few that have been processed, 
which means that maybe they experience processes like volcanism or differentiation where um, heavier elements sink towards the center of that uh, rock or maybe they were um, in the process of being part of a planet and maybe there was a giant impact and um, you know that now, now instead of being primitive they have become processed so sometimes we do get meteorites from moon and mars which is kind of cool because um, it's cheap it's a cheap way to get moon rocks and mars rocks but the composition is a little bit different from the asteroid fragments that um, we have collected and compared to and not a lot of them do arrive from the moon and mars um, so how do meteorites relate to asteroids well, primitive meteorites are remnants from the solar nebula. Processed meteorites are fragments of larger bodies that underwent differentiation. So. Okay, the last section I want to talk about is comets. So some quick facts about them. They form beyond the frost line, so beyond um, Jupiter. Okay, they do have an icy counterpart compared to asteroids. The nucleus you could basically describe as a dirty snowball. They do have... Um, they can form tails, but most do not have tails, and we'll talk about how does that tail form. They remain frozen in the outer solar system, and then when they enter the inner solar system, which is inside Mars, then they tend to grow tails, as you can see here. So the nucleus of a comet is a dirty snowball. It's the source of material for the tail, because once it starts to get warmed up by sun's radiation, then um, the ices, the solids, get converted into a gas, hence the tail that you see here. Now, we have had, um, you know, we've been studying comets, like when they come into our area, we do our best to get as much information on them. There's a mission to study the nucleus of Comet Temple 1, it probably, it's, it's already happened, and I guess I should, should look up to see what happened to it, but projectiles did hit the surface on July 4th of 2005, and a lot of telescopes just studied the impact of that. Anatomy of a comet, so we have the coma, the atmosphere that comes from the comet's heated nucleus, so coma. And then sometimes you get two different tails. You get a dust tail that's pushed by photons, and you get a plasma tail that's pushed by the solar wind from the sun. So the plasma tail lines up with the sun, and the dust tail gets pushed by photons. So you can see this is actually kind of a cool picture. They zoomed in on this comet, showing you what's happening to it. Now the tail can grow as it gets closer to the sun. So here's our comets. Comets have a really weird elliptical um, pathway. Okay, So the nucleus warms, ice begins to vaporize and sublimate. We start to see a little fuzzy um, fuzziness around the nucleus. But then as it gets closer, the tail is always away from the sun, okay, because of the solar wind, but you can see that we have dust tails pushed by uh, photons or sunlight. And then once it is done orbiting the sun, it'll go back to its origin, if you will. Um, so yeah. So comets do eject small particles that follow the comet around. Um, it can cause meteor showers when Earth crosses that pathway or that orbit, and then you get to see some really cool meteor showers. So meteors um, in a meteor shower, they always seem to come from the same local sky. And it's kind of like when you guys are driving in your car at night and it's snowing and you feel like you're in warp drive um, or light speed if you're a Star Wars fan. So it's basically the same principle. Um, Earth is traveling through space through like this, so all the meteors tend to come from or originate from the same local sky, much like you are in your car when it's snowing. Now the origins of comets, there's two origins, the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. Um, only a tiny number enter our inner solar system, but most stay really, really far away. So the Kuiper belt is very orderly. As you can see, it's almost in the same plane as our solar system. 30 to 100 AUs in a disk of our solar system. But the Oort cloud has very, very random orbits, so they try to depict that here. And it's a lot larger with its uh, elliptical. So how did comets get here? Well, 
Kuiper belt comets form in the Kuiper belt. I just said the Kuiper belt is in a flat plane aligned with our planetary orbits that orbit in the same direction as our planets. The Oort cloud was once closer to the sun, but they were kicked out by gravitational interactions from the gas giants. So um, now we get orbits in any direction. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about about uh, comets and meteorites tomorrow. I'll pick it up with Pluto and um, compare Pluto to comets. And yeah, we'll finish up chapter, chapter